start recording. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Public Invention Inventors Gathering, which happens the third Thursday of every month, uh, this is July. My name is Robert L. Reed. I'm the president and founder of Public Invention, and today I'm going to be speaking on the topic of the mind-blowing beauty of computer programming. Uh, can everybody uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. We have a small audience today, so you all feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, I kind of have mixed feelings about this talk because although it's really close to my heart, I know there's no way I can do um, justice to it. I could spend a year preparing this talk and I wouldn't do justice to it. Um, what I'm going to try to explain to you is magic, and then even deeper magic. And it's it's actually very important to me. Um, computer science is a new art from uh, really the 1930s. Uh, uh, Lady Babbage did a little bit of work before that, but it really wasn't until the 1930s that it, that it became a mathematical art, so to speak. Um, that was before the majority of electronic computers, there were still mechanical computers at that time. And uh, although it wasn't entirely obvious at that time, we now know that computer science sits at the intersection of physics and math. It also touches upon philosophy and epistemology, the study of what can be known. And in, in a sense, computer science is um, an extension of what is knowable. Now, um, the fact that computer science could be considered a branch of physics is really, really deep and relates to things like um, astrophysics and uh, quantum mechanics and, and certain other Im important aspects of physics. Um, for a while, it was considered sort of an extension of math, and, and it's also that, but it has its own character, so it, it's not really considered exactly math. Um, unfortunately, I have no hope of doing this talk justice. Uh, this is something that's really, really beautiful, and I doubt I'm going to be able to convey it to you in this talk. Um, there are no pretty pictures in this talk, uh, except one, maybe. And there will be a lot of oversimplifications. But I am going to be talking about what I consider to be magic, even deeper magic, and joy. So... Programming and theoretical computer science are different, but the same. To use modern slang, theoretical computer science is the God mode version of programming. But programming, humble, simple programming is the basis of the theoretical computer science. And it's the most general tool ever. That's why it's important. Of all the things that humanity has invented, Computer programming is not necessarily the most important or the best, but it is the most general. You can use it for almost everything. Today, it's needed in all the sciences, all engineering, and many arts. And therefore, I think all young people need to understand uh, at least a little computer programming in the same way that all people need to understand a little bit of algebra. So... Uh, I'd like to ask the question, what is a computer? So to me, a computer is a mindless machine that can only do very simple mechanical things. Um, now, technically the word machine to a mechanical engineer means the application of force. I don't mean that. I use the term to emphasize it has no creativity, no slop, and each step is completely predictable from the last. Now, it's, it's quite an extraordinary fact that a computer can really only do five things. And you could, uh, you could organize these a little differently, but this is the way I organized it back when I was 16 years old, and, and I still think it's correct. It can input a number, it can store a number, can do arithmetic on numbers, can output a number, and it can make a decision based on a number. But those numbers, can be used to represent a lot of things. And 
on the basis of these very, very simple actions by building them up to, in, into a, an edifice of structure of the way things are organized, we can do extraordinary things. So we can ask, what is a program? So a program is a set or sequence of instructions for a computer, which is just a machine, um, which are executed in a particular order that can change based on what's in storage. This is also sometimes called an algorithm because it doesn't actually require a computer. Humanity developed algorithms for mathematics, which were step-by-step -step procedures before computers existed. Nonetheless, the nature of a program is that it's a set of instructions that are executed in a certain order that tell a computer what to do in the next step. So the first magic that this produces is that complexity and really quite a lot of complexity emerges from simplicity. With the basic five things that I said, even a beginner programmer can compute the factorial of a number. And we're going to see that later on in this talk. Um, do a, an extraordinary thing called Conway's Game of Life, which I'm going to show you a demonstration of, which is kind of the best example of complexity rising up out of simplicity. And you can also simulate a role-playing game that feels real, even though it isn't real. You can create a character. You say, my fighter takes out his sword and whacks the wizard. And it feels like the wizard's really there and you're fighting, even though you programmed it. You know the wizard, in the end, is just a set of numbers. And the fighter is just a set of numbers. So there's almost no uh, creativity in it. Now, um, I have never been an educator, but when I teach beginning courses in computer programming to teenagers, which I've done a few times, these are the three programs that I teach first. The second aspect of magic that computers allow is that they allow you to simulate physics, obviously via, via mathematics. Mathematics is the language of physics. Without mathematics, we can only do a little bit of physics. Now, what is it that we do when we talk about physics? Well, Leonard Susskind has said, the purpose of physics is to compute, is to predict the future. So for example, you predict the future of where a ball is gonna fall. If you throw it up in the air, you know it's gonna come down. And if you're a good physicist and you know exactly how fast you threw it up, you know exactly where it's gonna land. These sorts of simulations can be done by a computer. And in very important circumstances, they succeed when math fails. That is, there are situations which we as a human society do not know how to solve with math very well, but we can still solve them with a computer by simulating things over time. Now, there are limits to that. So there are problems that a computer can solve that are, are hard to solve any other way. So the famous three-body problem, which is considered to be unsolvable in math, recently there was a Netflix show about it, um, can be solved by a computer in a limited way. It can simulate the position of three stars or planets or meteors in space orbiting each other over time and it can do that one millisecond at a time and it can do that for billions of milliseconds and it will be fairly accurate let's say 100 years from now now some people would say that's not a solution to the problem in the sense that it's not a formula that you can write down that tells you where the planets are nonetheless it's better than any other solution that we have in the same way we can't write down a formula that describes the flow of air around an airplane, but we can simulate. Now, there's a great philosophical debate as to whether an individual neuron can be described mathematically. It's unclear if neurons are actually extraordinarily complex or extraordinarily simple. You can find people who will tell you either, either one. 
Um, but it's possible that we can simulate the action of neurons, and therefore we can simulate the action of brains. We can also simulate the action of rays and waves in biological tissues, and that is the reason that we have MRIs, CAT scans, and PET scans. Without those, we would not be able to address the diseases that we address that way. So the third magic is something that we're all familiar with. You're using it right now. You're seeing a picture of me and you're hearing my voice. But inside a computer, those are represented as little bitty numbers, which are transmitted through a network and come to your computer and then are translated back into little blips of light on your screen and voltage levels on your speaker. This does not take a lot of theoretical computer science, but most of us enjoy computers because they can store and transmit representations of light and sound in the form of sounds and movies. Now, coincidentally, they can store every word ever written by human beings, which is the basis for large language models in, in modern artificial intelligence. So we're going to talk a little bit about programming later, but I want to talk about theoretical computer science, which I consider to be deeper magic. So the deeper magic number one is that you can prove there are things computers can't do and can't ever do. This is the basis of cryptography. We've now proved there are problems that can't be solved by computers. Uh, some of the cryptographic problems are simply because we don't have fast enough computers, but there are other problems which can never be solved by any computer. They can never be solved by any sequence of instructions, no matter how fast the computer is. And, and that's really a mind boggling sort of uh, concept in my opinion. So this leads to a thing called Church's thesis. Um, Alonzo Church was an American logician who worked in the thirties. Um, the computation done by modern computers are probably the only kind of computations that can ever be done. Now, this is called Church's thesis because it cannot really be proved. Um, so it's a thesis rather than a, a proof. So we have several different models of computation. One is the von Neumann machine, which is um, very similar to the electronic machines that we have. So my Macintosh computer would be closest to a von Neumann machine. There's the Turing machine, which has been made famous by movies, which was invented a little earlier than the von Neumann machine. Um, our computers today are not shaped like Turing machines, uh, but they're uh, similar. And then there's a very unappreciated form of computation called the Lambda calculus. And the interesting thing is that you can simulate each of these computers with the other. So the Lambda calculus is powerful enough to simulate a Turing machine. A Turing machine can simulate a von Neumann machine and a von Neumann machine can simulate the Lambda calculus. So you get uh, what can be described as a trippy loop in that everything is powerful enough to simulate the other. So none can be more powerful than the other. Now, is that the only kind of computation that can exist in the world? Well, we don't really know, but that's very strong evidence that there is no other form of computation, that there is no other way to do it. Now, some people would argue that biological brains and analog computation are a little asterisk to this and that quantum computing kind of nibbles at the edges of this a little bit, but fundamentally this is accepted by most people. So the deeper magic of theoretical computer science is what I call the dismal deep magic. So it may be that thought and computation are the same. It may be that human brains cannot think anything that can't be thought by a computer. And it may be that the sex success of artificial intelligence proves not that machines are intelligent, but that humans are dumb, right? It, it may not be that artificial intelligence is, is somehow coming alive or getting a soul spark or having consciousness. It may be that, that we're learning 
that our own brains are actually not capable of very much. Now, I hope that's not the case, but uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting philosophical point. So there's an even deeper magic, and there, there's no way I can really explain it in this uh, talk if you don't understand it. But there's a problem in computer science called P is equal to NP, which is a question. Is P equal to NP? P is the set of problems that can be solved in polynomial time. NP is the set of problems that can be solved in what's called non-deterministic polynomial time. If you're a beginner, there's no way I can explain this in, in this talk. But uh, I want what I want to point out is that P equal NP is the most important problem known to humanity today. In movies and so forth, you sometimes hear about the Riemann hypothesis. Riemann hypothesis is a chunk change compared to P equal NP. If humanity could show that P is equal to NP, which is not obvious that it is, most people think it isn't, then the world would change because in practice we could compute things efficiently which we could never compute before. Some things would still remain out of reach, however. And fundamentally, this asks the question, if you can verify something efficiently, is there always a way to compute it efficiently? And the answer is not obvious. The greatest mathematician, computer scientist, and even physicist in the world have been working on this problem for 40 years. And uh, in fact, I would argue they haven't actually made very much headway on it. Now, the final really deep magic is information theory. Information theory is where theoretical computer science overlaps with physics. And everything I say here has to be an oversimplification, has to be taken with a, a grain of salt. But nonetheless, uh, it, it's very important to understand. Information theory is closely related to the idea of entropy, and that is the laws of thermodynamics and conservation of in energy, and the fact that um, the universe, in a sense, is running down, that we're moving towards a less interesting, less concentrated state of energy, that everything is always smoothing out and becoming more boring, so to speak. Information theory is independent of computers, although we didn't know that uh, 50 years ago. Um, and it applies to many physical processes. For example, the Nyquist limit of the Fourier transform, uh, but also um, really fundamental things like how black holes work um, are related to information theory in a way which I only partially understand. I partially understand this. So it's kind of true that energy is equal to information, and it's kind of true that information is equal to entropy. Now, obviously, this is an oversimplification because entropy is not energy. Entropy is the opposite of energy. Nonetheless, in very special circumstances, information is similar to energy, and in different circumstances, information is similar to entropy. So now we can ask the, the really fundamental question, which, which I want everyone, especially if you're a beginner here, to understand and be intrigued by. What does a programmer do? I've believed for a long time that the job of a programmer is to create order out of chaos. So um, from uh, long before the birth of Christ, uh, there was a famous hymn to Zeus by Cleanthes, and it begins, chaos to thee is order. And in the middle of it, in one translation, obviously it was written in Greek, you can say, but you know how to make the crooked straight and to bring order to the disorderly. Even the unloved is loved by you. The poet is speaking to Zeus. For you have so joined all things into one, the good and the bad, that they all share in a single unified everlasting reason. And of course, the Christian and Judaic Bible begins, let there be light. That's what a programmer does. They bring light out of darkness and order out of chaos. So fundamentally, a program systemizes that which was not systemized previously. 
So the main tool of computer programming is could be called abstraction. It's not that easy to understand what it means in this, this context. Programs have subroutines or functions, which can be reused. The reuse of a subroutine always costs a tiny amount of time and also a tiny amount of electricity. But once a subroutine is written, it can be used over and over again, and it never wears out. Just like the number 37 never wears out. In a sense, subroutines and mathematics are stronger than steel and diamonds. Steel and diamonds and granite eventually wear out, but math and subroutines don't. Abstraction is the main tool for making long programs short and is thus closely connected with bringing order out of chaos. Factorial, the first program that programmers should learn, teaches abstraction through recursion. Now, there's a thing called lambda lifting that I recommend um, an interested student read the Wikipedia article on lambda lifting, which is sort of the formal way in which abstraction enters computer programming. But most programmers will, will not understand lambda lifting. They will instead think of when I create a subroutine, I am creating abstraction, which I can reuse again and again. So my own personal style of programming is based on something that Paul Graham said. He wrote an essay called Concision is Power. And I view the act of programming as being almost, there are exceptions, the same as trying to create the shortest, most compact representation of something. And thus, in a way, creating the most abstract version of a sequence of instructions to accomplish something. Now, functional programming is a style in which subroutines are side effect free. This helps to bring order out of chaos because of something technical called referential transparency. And it's the most abstract way of working because it means that a function can be used in any context and always means the same thing. Now, this is debatable. We don't have time to go into it. Uh, some people don't like functional programming as much as I do. Another way of expressing this is a principle called dry or do not repeat yourself. In a computer program, there should never really be two lines that are the same. There should never be two subroutines that are the same. If you find yourself writing the same code, it should become a subroutine. And this principle can be applied to enormous aspects of computer programming. You should not have duplication in your data, just as you should not have duplication in your instructions. And in many, many circumstances, what people do is they copy and paste code from somewhere. And in so doing, they're violating the dry principle. And after years, programs become big, fluffy, disorderly things where things are almost the same, but not quite in different places and so forth. And that's very poor software engineering. But it takes beginners years to fully understand this and to fully understand how to avoid it. So now I'd like to talk about the very first program that I think everyone should write. Um, the first program is called Factorial, um, and it's written with an exclamation point. Uh, when I was in, in college, there was a young man who didn't know it was called Factorial. So when he saw in Factorial, he said, called it in, <laughs> as, if, as if it's very emphatically the way you, you say in. Um, in fact, in bang, sometimes pronounced bang, um, uh, or in factorial or in exclamation point, um, is used in the famous uh, formula from probability that's sometimes pronounced in choose K. It gives you the ways to choose K element, the number of ways to choose K elements from a set of N objects. This is all important to uh, poker players and all kinds of probability and all kinds of, of mathematics. But the definition of factorial itself is really, really simple. And this is it right here. This is actually in JavaScript. We could take this and we could run it. 
Okay. Now, um, I learned this so long ago, it no longer seems weird to me. But some of you reading it may not have learned this. And I remember how hard it was for me to understand when I was about 18 or 19 and I was first introduced to this, this concept. So what this code says is that the function that we call factorial, which is in bang, so to speak, has a mathematical definition. If n is equal to zero, the answer is one. If n is not equal to zero, the answer is n times the factorial of n minus one. Now, this is a trippy loop. Factorial is being defined in terms of itself. How can the computer know what factorial means when we're telling it what factorial means right now? It's not obvious. Now, to many people in this audience, it may be obvious, but when I was a boy, this was not obvious to me. Okay, you, you might ask the question, well, how on earth can the computer ever know how to do factorial of n minus one when we're defining it in terms of itself? It looks like a trick. Okay, and it takes a while to understand it. And in fact, the answer is this only works if you call factorial with a smaller number in the body of the function so that the problem is always somehow getting simpler and eventually it gets down to zero. If that is not true, you create an infinite loop. Infinite loops are much worse than trippy loops. So in fact, you could say that this function has a bug. If you called this with minus one, it would run forever because it would multiply minus one by the factorial of minus two, which would be minus two times the factorial of minus three, which would be minus three times the factorial of minus four. And that number would never become equal to zero and it would never stop. The second program is a program called Conway's Game of Life. And it was specifically designed to show how complexity arises out of simplicity, okay? And it, it at one kind of artificial level, it's a simulation of biological processes. These four rules are the only rules it has. And I believe this is the second computer program which every beginner should write. Okay, it's played on a grid like a chessboard, but the chessboard is considered not to be eight by eight, but to extend as far as you want it to. So it's played on a square grid and each grid is called grid cell square is called a cell. Okay, and a cell is either live or dead. And there's a clock that ticks and one generation leads to the next generation. So you start with some pattern and then you start generations. And the rule for each cell is simply these four rules. In a live cell with fewer than two live neighbors, that's the cells in a, the eight cells around it that touch it, dies as if by underpopulation. I prefer to think of it as loneliness. It dies of loneliness. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. It's happy. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies by overpopulation or crowding. And then here is a bit of magic. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction. Okay, simple rules that produce almost unbounded complexity. So now I'd like to show you an example of this is Conway's game of life. You guys can do this. I'm randomly putting this here. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just clicking on some numbers. So you see this consists of uh, a grid of squares and each square is considered a cell. Yellow means it's alive. And the gray means it's dead. Now, when I click next, it's going to do a generation. So some cells died and a few cells came into existence. 
and the pattern changed. And now the pattern is going to change again and again and again and again. And now I can simply start running it and we'll see what happens. Not done yet. It's not done yet. It's not done yet. It's not done yet. Now it's done. So how could that complexity that you just saw arise out of those four rules? That is the thing which is of sort of um, paramount importance to mathematicians and uh, related to what I'm talking about, the um, uh, uh, the, erot the ability of simplicity to give birth to complexity. Okay, and then finally, an exercise that I think all beginning computer programmers should do is to write a very simple sort of fantasy role-playing game that has characters in it. And you can have the characters fight like you do in Dungeons & Dragons so that a fighter can whip out a sword and say, I attack the wizard and I strike the wizard with my sword and the, the wizard's health goes down. And then the health, the wizard cast a magic spell, uh, perhaps to catch the um, fighter in a web, which decreases their ability to strike in the future. Now, um, the thing about this is you play it, it's simple, it's fun, and it feels alive but you programmed it you know very well the wizard is not alive the wizard is just a subroutine the wizard is literally 10 or 15 lines of code that you yourself programmed representing only with numbers now if you don't want to do that you can think of a complicated game uh an expensive game like minecraft or something like that accomplishing the same thing it feels real even though we know in the end it is nothing more than a complicated series of the five operations i began this talk with so programming is almost reason but not quite it is almost human reason but it isn't exactly programming does not tell the poet what word to select or the musician how to play the note perfectly or the painter how the brush stroke should go. But nonetheless, the act of programming is very close to the act of human reasoning. For a hundred years, coming up on a hundred years now, literally, we have been making programming tools more powerful. So for example, John von Neumann did not believe in compilers. He believed it was a sign of mental weakness if people had to use compiled computer languages. He thought you should program them sort of only with the, the most minimal set of instructions. Um, he was weird. Each increase in the strength of the programming tools has not made programming obsolete. It has not decreased the number of people making gainful living by being programmer. It has made programming more important and given gainful employment to more people. So I personally do not believe anyone should fear that AI will replace programming that it's the same as saying AI will replace human reasoning. AI will become a tool used by programmers. Now, I have not used it. I don't use Copilot or any AI tools uh, for that. But at some point, I may have to learn how to do that. On the other hand, I do think we should fear killer robots. I'm much more worried about killer robots than I am uh, my ability to think being replaced by an artificial intelligence. So there are a lot of joys associated with computer programming. And um, I got to experience these when I was a child, almost. Uh, I started programming when I was 13, not very well. It took me a long time to learn a lot. I didn't have anyone to learn from. Um, I wish every child could experience this joy. I wish everyone could, could do these. Now, there are other ways to learn these joys, but computer programming is a darn good way to, to do it. As Leonardo da Vinci said, 
the joy of understanding is one of the greatest pleasures that humanity can have. And computer programming is all about understanding. Often you begin in confusion and you move towards understanding because you bring order out of chaos. You bring light out of darkness. You start from a situation of not understanding a problem and then you understand it. There's the joy of discovery, which I think is, is quite different. That's where you learn something surprising. Um, sometimes you d discover surprising problems. Sometimes you discover surprising solutions. Sometimes, like in the case of Conway's Game of Life, you discover surprising things which are neither problems nor solutions. They're just surprising things about the mathematical world in which we live. And then perhaps the greatest joy is the joy of creation. You can write a program. You can create something out of nothing which did not exist before and something important as well. Of course, you can do that by knitting a sweater, but one form of creation is writing a computer program. And then you can experience the joy of mastery, the joy of moving from a state of not being very good at something to being pretty good at it. Um, I do not consider myself to have mastered computer programming. Uh, I'm still learning. I, I wish I had time to learn more. I, I'm considering myself a journeyman programmer, so to speak. Um, my One of my heroes, Kent Beck, said that confusion should be cherished because it precedes enlightenment. And computer programming is all about moving from a state of confusion to a state of enlightenment. And then finally, there's the joy of sharing. Um, in a way, there are not many programs in the world. There is only one universal program. It is splintered between my computer and Lawrence's computer and Christina's computer and Morena's computer. But in a way, there's really only one computer program in the whole world, and we are all writing parts of it we are writing little bitty parts of it. So we are all sharing in a given enterprise. For many people, a great joy that they get to experience in college, and I, and I wish everyone got to go to college, I know some people don't, is to um, share their programs with other people, sometimes in a classroom setting, sometimes not. I remember uh, one time I was in a graphics class at the University of Texas when I was in graduate school and my friend, Steve Benz, uh, <laughs> put up on his screen a graphic program and he programmed a little airplane to fly around the tower of, of a representation of a tower of an airport and it was it was an astonishing thing to to have accomplished quite quite beautiful uh i really enjoyed that when i was at rice university uh there was there was a student there uh who was quite in, unusual and i would walk by his terminal and on it there was a weird glyph and I, I couldn't figure out what it was. So, you know, I asked the guy and he said, well, it's Elvish. <laughs> he had created an ASCII art representation of the letter, the Elvish characters that Tolkien had created, which are called Tinguar, um, an example of nerdy stuff. Uh, but it was more fun because it was shared. And then finally, and my talk is closing now, um, there's the joy of meaning and this is the deepest thing to me. Public invention gives everything it does to the whole world. We don't keep anything secret. Everything we do is shared through open source licensing. Uh, we've been trying to save people's lives for a while now through global medical stuff. I doubt anyone's life has ever been saved by one of our inventions, although it is our goal and we're working towards it. Things take time to ripen. Uh, I, I have faith that it will eventually happen. Programming is an important part of our work. Almost everything now requires computer programming. Programming is part of our work and our work is meaningful. And therefore the programming is meaningful. So thank you for your support of Public Invention. Thank you for listening. I've got a few uh, references here, uh, which people can look up uh, on, on Google if they want. And uh, I will now open the floor to questions.
well, I should have been here at eight. And for some reason, I thought it started at 830. Oh, that's okay. Victoria, Christina has raised her hand. Go ahead, Christina. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I've never actually kind of thought about that all laid out in such a way. Uh, I feel like it's it's one of those programming in general is one of those things that I've I've been around for a long time and have a very, very, very tiny bit of experience with myself. But it's, if you're around it so much, you often don't necessarily think of the origins of it. <laughs> um, but I did have a question that came up and it's something that I never thought of much myself. Um, and it's, I love the slide on factorials, by the way. So in calculating um, factorials, you the first, two things that come to mind are recursive function versus iterative. So I was wondering if, um, like from a programming standpoint, like different characteristics or use cases specific to either using a recursive or iterative approach um, in programming. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. It's a really good question because, um, in fact, you can prove, in a sense, that you you don't have to do this recursively. So what Christina is saying is this self-reference, the fact that factorial is defined in terms of factorial, is called um, recursion. You could write um, factorial as what's called a loop, and you would count down, and you, you would examine the value in, and you, you, you would count across in and, and, and do it that way. Um, so you don't have to do it this way except there are things over time which become so complicated it would be almost impossible to do all of them um iteratively for example you could be working on a a solving a differential equation you know or some very very big thing and you're in the middle of it and you're down in the middle of a computation and now you have to do another factorial right you you have to have subroutines and you have to have abstraction in um in doing those things and there there are some things which um in order to not define them recursively you would almost have to stand on your head like like you could do it there's a mathematical proof that you don't have to have this because after all this programming language is being compiled into something which is just a set of numbers, which is doing the same thing, but it would become unnatural. It would become so complicated that you almost couldn't think about it. And it, it would get in the way of your thinking about it. And, and a, a proof of that is the formula on the right-hand side of this page, right? Here we have n bang, and it's expressed in terms of k bang and n minus k bang. Mathematicians are using this, you know, using this sort of thing uh, referentially as a subroutine in the same way. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, you will see it defined both iteratively and recursively. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yes, it does. Um, and it kind of as a follow up to that, I don't want to, I don't want to hog all the question time, but um are there so pr from a computer programming standpoint are there more resource constraints with one versus the other so if so taking an iterative approach versus recursive like what does yeah. that what does it mean for the programmer when you're having to choose between the two okay so there are people who will tell you that an iterative approach is more efficient because a um, recursive approach appears on the surface to use more memory, okay? And so there are times when an iterative approach would be better. And let me let me return to this and try to explain this in the, the in the deepest possible way. Okay. So, for example, the way this is implemented in a computer in a, in, as the languages compile 
it's turned from this representation into a different representation. And you almost can't discuss it without talking about what's called a stack frame. And whenever you make a call, you push onto the stack, which is called because it's like a cafeteria tray of, uh, a, in a cafeteria, you know, you have a spring loaded stack of trays sometimes. You, you push things onto the stack and, you, and you, you build things up and then you take things off the stack, okay? You push the variables here onto the, the stack. Well, however many calls you make, uh, each one of those has to have a memory representation. You can run out of memory, okay? Now, you can do it, it, it appears, on the surface that you can do it more efficiently iteratively because you wouldn't have that extra space. However, this program, the way it's written is what's called tail recursive in the sense that the, the use of factorial is the last thing in what's being done here. So the compiler knows that and can automatically implement an efficient way of doing it. So in practice, it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, another way that I, if I wanted to, I could attack what you're saying is I could say, yes, it might be more efficient in terms of computer instructions, but computer instructions are cheap. What's hard is the clarity of the program to make it in an ordered fashion. And so I would be very loath to write it in a more efficient way if it decreased the clarity of the program from a human understanding point of view. There's another saying in computer science, which is that um, uh, um, premature optimization is the root of all evil. That was That's famously said by um, Donald Knuth, uh, a very important computer scientist. So let me, let me just show you here what happens. Um, so over here on the right, this is actually a uh, the development tools which are built into the Chrome browser and it runs JavaScript. And so I can paste this pro oops. I could paste this program in here, but it, it's apparently please type allow posting in here. So it's got a nice security feature. It won't let me post it in. Oh, allow pasting. Okay. Ah. Well, I'll do it the old fashioned way. I'll type it. So I, I already typed this in. Okay. So this is JavaScript. This is completely legal JavaScript. Okay. And I can call factorial of zero and it's one. And I can call factorial of 10 and it'll be a big number. And I can call factorial of 20. And I can call factorial let's say 100. This may not work. Okay, and it kind of works. And it, it's a very, 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 very large number. Right? Um, now, eventually, we'll run out there's a bug in this program in a sense. Factorial is not actually defined on negative numbers, but if I run this on a negative number, as I said before, it will go into an infinite loop. So we're gonna see what happens when it does that. So what it actually says is maximum call stack size exceeded. What it did is it kept going until it ran out of its own memory. Now it's smart, so before, it crashed my computer, it caught it. And it said, oh, I'm not gonna let you make that call again. That may be more than you wanted to know about that. No, no, and then, sorry. So one last thing would be, so would you say that recursion then is more suitable for problems that could be broken down into similar sub problems? And the thing that first comes to mind for me is like some of the sorting algorithms Whereas when I think of iteration, I think of more suitable program uses for 
problems that would require repeated execution of a block code, linear searches, things like that? Yes. Okay. So I would say yes. And the best example of that, if you want to Google it right now, is um, Google Quicksort. Okay. Quicksort is a very simple um, program here. Let me create a new slide. Um, it's not necessarily the best the best sort in the world, but it's it's extraordinarily simple. And that's why it, it's done. It was created by um, another famous computer scientist I had the pleasure of meeting, uh, Charles Anthony Robert Hoare, who for some reason was called Tony. Uh, so <laughs> Tony Hoare created Quicksort. And Quicksort looks like this. And I, I can't, this is not going to be correct JavaScript. Quicksort of, and I'll call it S, is a sequence. Okay, and what I do is I is I'll say let A be first half of S. That is the first if S has a hundred members to be the first fifty. Okay, and exactly how I do that I would depend on the exact language I'm in. But let you know let B be the second half of S. Okay, um, uh, now I'm, I'm forgetting it. Okay. And so then what you do is you do a quick sort of A. And then you do a quick sort of B so that those two are sorted. And that, that gives you back two lists of 50 numbers, which are each sorted. And then you, you merge them very simply. And I, maybe I'm forgetting because that would be called a merge sort instead of instead of a quick sort. I think maybe quick sort finds the median uh, value and takes all the lower ones and then all the upper ones and then sorts those two and then merges it back. But it's fundamentally recursive in the way that you just described because you're taking a list of 100 elements, breaking it into two lists of 50, sorting the two lists of 50, and then doing something very simple to put it back together. Now, it can be done iteratively as well but it is probably harder to understand it iteratively mm -hmm. than by doing it recursively so why do it that makes sense that's really cool so i i don't know you know a lot of applications i you know because i don't don't do computer programming but i do know that a lot of what's behind some of these companies that are doing really extensive gene analysis, so analyzing genetic combinations and permutations, they're using programs with a lot of factorial calculations involved. So that's how they're discovering like different gene combinations correlate with certain syndromes or, uh, you know, uh, yeah. genetic mutations. That's yeah. that's like the, the first real world case that comes to my mind. Well, right. Okay. So, so here's something mind blowing. Even the act of, so to us, the act of multiplying two numbers is simple. And in JavaScript, it's simple. You just write A star B, and that multiplies two numbers together. Okay. But as A becomes gigantic and B becomes gigantic, it starts to be inefficient to multiply it the way humans multiply numbers. Okay. Of course, uh, you would never think of worrying about this until it was more than like a thousand digits on each side. But the numbers you deal with in genomic combinations can, can get really big. There's an entire science of computer science that deals with asymptotic complexity where you try to create the most efficient algorithms you can. I do not fully understand this, but the most efficient way to multiply numbers is actually with the Fourier transform. Okay, so that algorithm for multiplying very, 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 very large numbers is quite unnatural compared to what we as school children learn to do in our multiplication. And if you were trying to compute factorial, you might do the same thing and you might use approximations. And there are all kinds of all kinds of tricks to make that go faster. And there's an entire science behind that, which is usually not done. Usually computer programmers don't worry about that until they're at least out of college.
Oh, do we have any other questions? <laughs> um, I'll let other people ask questions. Otherwise, we will be here all night with me being like, what about this? What about I, that? <laughs> I am always at your service, Christina. <laughs> all right. I'm sure others have, have questions, so I'll, I will let others ask them. Another thing I learned in graduate school is that silence is golden. And often, if you just wait long enough, people will ask a question, even though they're shy. I don't really have a question, but I did have a comment, though. Um, in your description of uh, one of the things I think that I, I think is kind of overlooked is the root word of um, analog computing is I think it's shared with analogy. And I like thinking of um, computing as an analogy that is running on base level physics uh, or base level reality. And that that level of, and what we're basically doing is creating a story that is playing out in front of us in the world around us. And the story is, and we, we are consistent with our story and the consistency of our story reinforces our understanding and um, in our logic in a way that gives us um, belief and understanding of, of the things that we're doing and the, and the answers that we're getting. Um, it's a little poetic, but the, um, but it, it allows you to start thinking that like water can be used in, in computing. Um, gravity can be used in computing. Uh, mechanical structures can be used in computing. DNA can be used in computing. Like computing is all around us. And it's, it's really the, the analogy and the stories that we use to construct um, and the mathematical themes and theories behind those, those, those properties that kind of really make it happen. Yeah, that's all true. Um, you can make a computer out of pneumatic valves or water valves, and people did before electronics were available. But the computing that is all around us doesn't do what I would call general purpose computing in general. Physical processes tend to be smooth and continuous. And in that sense, they're a very limited form of computation. For example, a slide rule or a caliper, you can be used to multiply numbers, but only in a, only in a very, very limited way. Making a Turing machine or a Turing complete machine or von Neumann machine or lambda calculus machine out of a slide rule would be very hard. Um, and so the electronic computer and the, the attempts to make mechanical computers, which famously Lady Ada Babbage did, um, created a new era of uh, computation. I'd agree with that. There's there's still a open question of can you build an, a general purpose analog computer? Um, and then the the corollary would be can you build a general purpose uh, neural network um, with the drill, with the neural fabric? Um, and which is currently a very hot topic right now in AI research. Um, I agree, but that question is bigger than I can address in this talk. One thing I think it's underappreciated that I also want to bring up is that um, the advances in computing that we're currently seeing have allowed us to tackle problems that were previously un we were unable to really address. Um, I think that's I think that's going to open up new areas in biology, in physics, and in uh, in our understanding of like the the big the bigger world out there and the small world out there. So I think that's I think it's underappreciated because um, it, it, ten years ago we couldn't model um, with the fidelity that we had uh, that we can today with the number of variables and the number of um, factors. 
Yep. That's correct. Does anyone else have a comment? Um, I just, I think it's really cool to think about, and uh, Lawrence's first comment made me think of this. It's really cool to think about the fact that all of these, well, most of these equations or calculations that are, you know, given examples here, they have been around since ancient times. Like these were, you know, the, the end notation wasn't really developed until later, but the, the like core idea can be traced back to, you know, we're talking like, you know, At BC. Least a thousand years. Yeah. And it's how, how we've kind of evolved the use cases of these equations to, for computational purposes. So instead of us using these equations ourselves, we have machines now that do it for us. Um, but a lot of the earlier uses of them were just, you know, obviously we think of like physics and astronomy. Um, but even before then, it was kind of just this almost like pondering of what if. <laughs> so what if I take these numbers and do this? What happens? Um, so these very, very ancient, ancient calculations that are very much a part of our modern life in a big way. We we wouldn't we wouldn't have modern life today without them. Yes. I mean, just just think of how humanity's power was expanded by the development of those mathematical algorithms before there were computers, right? I mean, you know, before that you had uh, questions that, that we would think, well, that's a, a computable answerable question and people might not know how to answer the question, right? They might not know how what's the area of a sphere, right? They might not know what's the area of a cone. They might not know that if you have a right triangle, the square of the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides. Although that's been known for a long time, presumably there was some time in the past when it wasn't known, right? Um, and so that gets back to my point. It, it, computer programming is a form of mathematics that brings order out of chaos and it, it expands our power. And to me, the computer is an extension of the human brain. It's not a replacement. It's an exobrain, if you will, just the way Tony Stark's iron suit is a exoskeleton. Wikipedia is a part of my exobrain. And I can use a computer to perform calculations, which would be very awkward or impossible for me to perform in, in other circumstances. Um, so, um, in a very real sense, it's it both the act of systematizing things which weren't systematic before extends human power and the electronic computer, which can do these things very rapidly, also extends human power. Do we have any other questions or comments? Last question. One. What's your That's favorite right. equation? Me? Yes, favorite equation and why? Well, um, force equal mass times acceleration because it's a... Um, it's a it's a second order differential equation which happens to be easily solvable and from which we can derive um, an extraordinary number of effects. I have another question, maybe more um, kind of philosophical. You, you started with a definition of what a computer is okay. and kind of explaining it can only basically input and, and output numbers, but with programming and now um, AI or machine learning, is there, are we getting to the point where 
basically these programs or these computers can think much faster than we do. I know we they can solve equations, but are is it getting to the point where they can quote unquote learn faster than us? And how do we keep up the understanding of like you're saying a computer can only do something that's traceable? Um, is there a point where uh, maybe like in comparative to to our human reasoning, um, is there a point where we're too slow to kind of understand um, these programs and machines? Well, it's a really good question. Let me give you the answer that pro AI people give, and then I'll tell you what I think, okay? Pro AI people point out that although large language models, which is one aspect of artificial intelligence are relatively in their infancy, they already beat human beings at standardized tests such as the graduate G, the GRE and the SAT and the ACT and they can do well on tests of biology and, and physics and so as my friend David Jeske has pointed out every time humanity has said well computers aren't really intelligent because they can't play chess or they can't play go or they can't um, write poetry uh, you know those have all fallen right like they mm -hmm. Then they do those things, right? And um, curmudgeons like me keep saying, oh, well, they aren't really intelligent, even though they can answer a bunch of questions that I can't possibly answer. Okay, but then I'll tell you what I think, uh, just because it, it's, I think the honesty is, is worthwhile. I mean, sure, an AI could beat me at a biology test, but an AI has had an infinite amount of time to learn, and to it, it's an open book test. Hmm. And AI can't compete with me at all in any real problem that it hasn't had a bajillion cycles of 50 gigawatts of power to study ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so I don't accept artificial intelligence as thinking and being able to learn things at all. Now, obviously you can build a classifier, right? Like you could classify leaves and it'll tell you what kind of tree it came from better than I can personally remember the shape of leaves, you know, to do it. It would mm. beat me at that task, right? Um, it would beat me at translating French into English, but it doesn't beat me at understanding, even though it can translate French into English better than I can. I, I think the question does come down to um, oh. position. Go ahead, Melanie. I mean, the question comes down to what is what does it mean to be human? It's cre creativity, you know, novel ideas, I guess. Yeah. I'm. I'm. You know, I can't claim to be more creative than an AI. Uh, but still, I, I, I feel that all human beings have something in them which I have not yet seen in an AI. Maybe five years from now, the little child that is artificial intelligence will have grown into something um, worthy of respect. You know? Uh, and then are we going to say switching the machine off is murder? You know, did we kill an AI when, you know, the power failed? I I don't know. I pers I but at the moment I remain skeptical of these these things. Thanks for your perspective and the talk. It was very uh, interesting and informative. You're welcome. Any other questions?
Okay, hearing none, I think we'll um, stop the recording here.